Good evening, everyone. I'm Dr. Marty Ross, and this is another Conversations with Marty Ross, MD, tonight. Sorry I'm running a little bit late. I had a clinic day that went a little bit long here. Um, but it's good to be seeing patients again um, and to be working with people here in Seattle. Um, so for those of you that are new, welcome here for the first time. Uh, this is a webinar that you create with your questions. And uh, those of you that are back here again, I'm glad to see many uh, familiar names on my message board as well too. The way you participate is to write questions and you can do so in the chat box down here on the bottom of the screen on the right hand side. The only thing I ask is as you write your questions, um, try to be brief. <laughs> Long questions are difficult for me to post here. So try to be as brief as possible. And secondly, do not uh, hit the enter key until the whole question is complete, okay? If you hit the enter key before the question is complete, what it literally does is it sends multiple questions in my direction. They get very hard for me to follow from my side here. I am creating a recording of tonight's webinar, and if everything goes as planned, meaning if the recording works, um, I will be editing it later, and then I will have it ready to be published tomorrow morning. You will get an email from me uh, somewhere between 9, 9.30 in the morning, uh, which has information about how to watch that recording. I also have information about how to sign up for the webinar after that. Okay, so we have another webinar scheduled for next week, I believe, and the week after, I believe. Well, I'm not sure, at least next week, or we may have two in a row. I, I can't remember now what I what I put together for that. Uh, so, but I do hope you'll join us for the next one. There definitely is one next week, okay? Um, see here. If you happen to miss the, the email, you can find a rec the copy of the recording will be on the webinars page at my Lyme disease information site, which is Treat Lyme by Marty Ross, MD. You can also find it on the homepage of my supplement store, which is Marty Ross MD Supplements, and that URL is treatlime.com. And then finally, you can find it on my clinic website on the homepage, which is martyrossmd.com. Okay, so you got many places that you can find it if you happen to miss that email, okay? All right, so um, as I'm reading tonight, as I'm um, taking questions tonight, I will post the questions. Those of you that are participating in the live version will be able to see them. However, um, they don't show up in the recorded version, so I am gonna read them as well too, okay? And most of the time I can answer your questions. Sometimes you stump me, sometimes you give me new ideas. So uh, feel free to ask anything you want and we'll see if I can answer it for you, all right? All right, so let's go ahead and take the first question here. Hello, Lee. Let's see, when you use oregano oil for persisters, um, how do you dose it and where do you get it? How long do you suggest somebody take it for? Okay. So I, um, I'm in the process of actually getting a product for my store. I don't have it yet. But who I'm liking uh, to use for the oregano oil is a product by a pharmacy called Hopkinton Pharmacy, that's H-O-P-K-I-N-T-O-N um, in uh, Massachusetts. They're a compounding pharmacy and they've come up with a good compounded version of oregano oil. Um, their capsules that they have are 150 milligram capsules and I'm having people take it as one capsule twice a day. Occasionally, I may even increase that to two capsules twice a day, but for most people, one capsule twice a day, okay? So oregano oil, everybody, is one of the things that we are starting to try for persister cells that we see in both Lyme and that we see in Bartonella. So persisters, let me just talk about those briefly. So persisters are forms or some um, occur when either Bartonella or Lyme are exposed to antibiotics for a period of time. Some of the Lyme germs and some of the Bartonella germs will basically slow their metabolism way down and go into hibernation, okay? Those are called persisters. Persisters don't necessarily respond to the standard antibiotics that we use. And because of this, there's been a lot of research going on in the last four years or so looking at ways that we might approach persisters. There are There is only one drug of the persister regimens that we use that have been tried in, hum, in human studies, I should say, and that is a medicine called Dapsone that we sometimes will use for uh, Lyme persisters, all right? Most of the other medicines that we're trying for persisters are based upon research that we see in laboratory experiments, all right? So the laboratory experiments are telling us that one drug called disulfiram, which is anti-abuse, can work for Lyme persisters. 
And then research that comes to us out of uh, Johns Hopkins University out in Baltimore that was published about over it, about maybe a year and a half ago. And then more recent studies that were done on Bartonella published in November of this year show us that oregano is good for Lyme and Bartonella persisters in lab experiments, okay? And that another compounded prescription medicine that we can use called methylene blue is useful for both Lyme and Bartonella persisters too, okay? At this point, we have no studies that tell us whether this stuff actually works other than it will work on a Petri dish. But what works in a Petri dish does not necessarily mean it's gonna work in a human. But I am trying it. I know a number of my colleagues are trying these substances and we're trying to see if they're gonna work. Um, it's too early for me to say at this point because I've only been using them for maybe the last few months with my patients as to whether they're gonna make dramatic improvements or not. But oregano is one of those substances I am using to treat persister forms of Bartonella and persister forms of Lyme. Okay, all right. Thanks for that question, Lee. Um, good luck to you. Hello, um, Kara, let's see. Can Lyme or co-infections lead to urinary incontinence? Does oil of oregano treat the cyst form or the spirochete? Is it true that doxy causes less gut dysbiosis than other pharmaceutical antibiotics? And uh, boy, you got a lot of questions here tonight. <laughs> and let's see, do you, what do you make of fatigue that tends to manifest as sort of heaviness in the chest and the heart area in a 120 pound female? And finally, do you accept insurance like Medicaid for your consults? Okay, so I, I, the answer to your last question, I don't take any insurance. I'm not contracted with any insurance. And the reason is, is insurance companies have been known to bankrupt a number of my colleagues that treat Lyme disease. And many of you may be familiar with a physician named Dr. Jemsek. Uh, Jemsek was persecuted by the medical board in North Carolina, and they removed his license a number of years ago before subsequently he did relocate and set up practice in Washington, D.C. But the outcome of his actions in North Carolina is that the insurance companies then sued him for not following the IDSA guidelines and they bankrupted him, okay? And there's other people that that has happened to too. So therefore, most of us that treat Lyme do not take insurance because we don't want to sign insurance contracts and then have the insurance companies turn around and sue us for treating people beyond the recommendations in the Infectious Disease Society of America guidelines, all right? So I want to be here to keep treating people. And the only way I can do that is if I have resources to do it too. So I, I, I don't take insurance contracts because I won't make myself liable that way, okay? All right. And that's the case with most of us that don't take insurance contracts as well too. All right. Oil of oregano, um, I'm not sure if it treats spirochete or cyst forms. I do know it treats persister forms, okay? Um, let's see, is it, well, I, yeah, I'll just say it that way. Is it true that doxy causes less gut dysbiosis than other ones? Um, there's no studies that say that. There's no studies that say which antibiotic is worse for gut dysbiosis than another. So um, I, I, I can't agree with that, okay? Let's see. What do you make of fatigue that tends to manifest a sort of heaviness in the chest and the heart area? Um, I don't have, uh, it, it's just a way that it manifests. I don't know that it means anything in particular. And I think that answers your question. Oh, the la your first one. Um, can Lyme or co-infections lead to urinary incontinence? So um, Bartonella sometimes can lead to bladder irritation, which causes the bladder to go into spasm which then may result in some incontinence. I have seen that happen before. I have not seen it happen in the case of um, the Lyme infection. Okay, all right. Thanks for the question. Good luck to you. Hello, Karen, let's see. Hello, Dr. Ross. Um, Thank you so much for taking my question. You have mentioned multiple sclerosis Lyme, Alzheimer's Lyme, et cetera. My son's been treated previously by Dr. Laxlin, Dr. Jemsek, and, and the Rawls protocol. Now on your Bartonella protocol for three months, the last two months on Siddha Okuda Um He is ravaged by 24 seven mind numbing pain. He likens to dystonia or multiple sclerosis-ish or fascia restricting 
atrophying his muscles, can't get blood into his limbs, much of his body is numb. The pain is depressing, maddening, exercises all day long. We apply pressure on his body, bringing temporary relief. Do you have any experience with what I'm crudely describing? Will your Bartonella protocol and the herbs heal this? Any other ideas? Um, I have seen a, 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 a limited number of patients with that same kind of situation. Um, you know, yes, treating Bartonella may help it. Um, if you're looking at the best ways to treat Bartonella, it'd probably be with prescription antibiotics. They tend to work about 80 to 85% of the time versus the herbal Siddha Akuta and Hutania will help about 70, 75% of the time. So could the Hutania and Siddha work? Yeah, it could, but with a less chance than the prescription antibiotics have at working, okay? One thing you may wanna consider for this, there's two things that I have tried with patients with some limited success. Sometimes it helps, sometimes it doesn't. Number one, for this type of muscle spasm, excruciating pain, working with medical marijuana, specifically THC, can sometimes be helpful in people, okay? So that means you would have to be in a state that allows you to get medical marijuana and you would wanna talk with your bud masters at the store and see if they can use products that are higher in THC, okay? Um, keep in mind with THC, it can be sedating sometimes. And so if, they, if you're gonna do that, sometimes it's better to use that at nighttime and in the daytime to use medical marijuana that is more CBD oil heavy, okay? For more information about medical marijuana, I will show you an article I've written about that so you can get some ideas about that, okay? All right. The other thing to consider trying would be to try something called low dose naltrexone. So naltrexone is a, that's if he's not on narcotics for his pain. So uh, low dose or uh, naltrexone is a chemical that is used to block narcotic receptors in our bodies, okay? And, um, but it can be used at super low doses. And so the reason it's called low dose naltrexone is it's manufactured as a 50 milligram pill, but we use it as a low dose naltrexone. We're using it somewhere between 1.5 to 4.5 milligrams. One of the things that the naltrexone does is it binds to a group of receptors in, um, immune system cells up in your brain called microglia. And it binds to a type of receptor up there called a toll-like receptor. And when it binds to that toll-like receptor, it alters the neurologic transmission of pain, okay? In fact, there's studies that shows that it's very useful in fibromyalgia type pain for that reason, okay? The other thing it does is it also can help regulate the immune system as well too. If So that is something to consider trying as well. Um, and that would be to start at 1.5 milligrams daily for about two weeks and you go up to three milligrams daily for two weeks and you go up to 4.5 milligrams, okay? Um, so let me show you two articles that you can look at to get more information about both of those options for you. All right, I'm gonna do a quick screen share here and I'm gonna show you my uh, Lyme disease information website. Okay, so what you're seeing there right now as I'm trying to get over to my main page, this is the Hopkinton Pharmacy uh, oregano oil, okay? All right, and again, I eventually will be adding that to my supplement store as well too. All right, let's go over here. So this is my Lyme disease information site. This is Treat Lyme by Marty Ross, MD. Um, in terms of things to modulate pain, take a look at my pain chapter. And the two things I would have you focus on is this one called medical marijuana, cannabis, and CBD for Lyme, okay? And then the other one I would take a look at is this article called LDN for Lyme, okay? All right, let me go back here. All right, thanks for that question, Karen, and good luck to your son. There we go, okay. It's having a problem pulling my uh, questions up here just a minute. Looks like I've got one person wrote the question twice, so I'm just trying to clean that out here. All right, let's see here. Hello, Renee, let's see, I had chronic Lyme disease for 15 years and the plasmapheresis 
and get better well just recently. I had been exposed, we don't know if it was a virus or not when I got get sick, fever, sinusitis, three weeks later from that, my knee started hurting joints that hurt with Lyme disease. So can, what's going around because old Lyme disease seems to flare up? I'm not, I'm, it's unclear to me how you've answered your question here. I, I think you're wondering, I'll try to rephrase it, okay? So if, if you happen to get a viral syndrome Sometimes when we get viruses like a COVID-19, for instance, coronavirus, or sometimes if we get cold viruses, or sometimes if we get the flu virus, symptoms that look like Lyme disease can get worse. And the reason that those symptoms can get worse is really what we call Lyme disease symptoms are actually inflammation symptoms caused by a group of chemicals called cytokines. So cytokines are made by white blood cells when they're trying to kill germs and get rid of germs, okay? And they're good and they're bad. On the good side, they cause more white blood cells to be made. They draw those white blood cells to where the infection is and they help those white blood cells, excuse me, white blood cells work better, all right? Now, in Lyme disease and also in mold toxicity illness and in uh, chronic yeast overgrowth in your intestines, one of the things that can happen is the immune system keeps trying harder and harder, even though it's not doing a good job. And eventually it makes too many cytokines, all right? And too many cytokines make you hurt all over, um, give you fatigue, uh, make it so you can't think. Uh, basically, too many cytokines really are what we call Lyme disease symptoms. So excess cytokines give you Lyme disease symptoms, okay? Now, if you've got a virus going through you, these viruses also trigger your immune system to make more cytokines. And so therefore, when you get a viral syndrome, sometimes it can make it look like your Lyme has gotten worse. And really what it is, is that you've made more cytokines because of having viral infection in you, okay? So thankfully, there's a number of things you can do to lower those cytokines. And uh, one of those is to be on liposomal curcumin. Curcumin is a component of turmeric. It gets inside of white blood cells and blocks their cytokine production, okay? The other thing that can be helpful is to be on liposomal um, glutathione. Um, the product I like for liposomal glutathione is a product by Research Nutritionals called Trifortify Orange or Trifortify Watermelon. Uh, glutathione is a very strong antioxidant that um, decreases oxidizing agents that signal white blood cells to make cytokines, okay? So curcumin gets on the inside and tells the cytokines not to be made in white blood cells. And what glutathione is doing is from the outside, it's blocking the signals that go to the white blood cells that tell them to make cytokines. So you could do, for curcumin, you could do a product by Thorne called Mariva 500, and you could take it as one pill three times a day. And then for your glutathione, what I like using is a product by Research Nutritionals called Trifortify Orange or Trifortify Watermelon. And of those, I would do one teaspoon one time a day, okay? Uh, good luck to your name. Thank you for that question. Oh, let me just show you another article to explain more about these cytokines. All right, so let's see here. So you could take a look at my online Lyme treatment guide and look in this chapter section here called Herxheimer and Cytokines. Okay, and then take a look at this article called Control Cytokines, a guide to fix Lyme symptoms and the immune system. Okay, it gives you, it explains the cytokines and also gives you different ways of lowering them. Okay, all right. And then if you're interested, if you're looking at where to get those two supplements I recommended, this is my supplement stores for my patients, but for anyone, anyone can buy from them. Okay, so if you wanted to do the curcumin, for instance, you just come here and type in curcumin. And this is that thorn curcumin product that I was telling you about, okay? All right, let me go back here. All right, good luck to you, Renee. Thank you for that question.
Hello, Sherry. Let's see here. Hold on here a minute. Let's see. Thank you for the weekly help you provide. What will we do without you? <laughs> I appreciate that. I'm, I'm glad to help out. I'm glad to help out. Let's see. What do you think of the following herbs with an antibiotic protocol? Um, astragalus and phosphatidyl. I think you mean phosphatidyl serine. Let me see if there's another part to your question here, Sherry. Yeah, and then you said, uh, would you recommend taking them? Okay, so I usually don't recommend these two herbs. So first of all, astragalus is, um, is an immune-boosting herb that I just don't find that much benefit in Lyme, so I don't use it, okay? And the phosphatidylserine is a type of fat that can make up uh, can be found in the covering of your nerves membranes and also in the uh, covering of your energy factory membranes called mitochondria. So every one of our cells has a mitochondria, a system of mitochondria. Mitochondria are the energy factories found in our cells and their covering is made up of a layer of fat that includes phosphatidylcholine and phosphatidylserine. Um, and phosphatidylserine is, and choline also make up the covering of your nerve cell membranes and all cell membranes, for instance, okay? So I sometimes will use phosphatidylserine, but I'm not usually going to use it by itself. I like usually using it within a pill that is a mixture of the kind of fats that make up our cell membranes and the mitochondria membrane. And those products that I like to use are all made by research nutritionals. There's one called ATP360. There's another one called... Um, NT factor, and there's another one called ATP fuel. And there's some differences in all of them, but essentially they're uh, substances made up of fats that are used to repair your cell membranes, as well as the uh, membranes that make up uh, the covering of your energy factories called mitochondria. Okay. All right. I'm going to show you a brief article that explains those products to you, and uh, then you can take a look at that later. So bear with me here. I'm just going to do a quick screen share. All right. So um, if you go back to my Lyme disease information site and take a look at, there's an article I've written about, I'm just going to put in type ATP fuel up here in the search bar. And you'll find this article that's called um, a comparison of ATP fuel, ATP 360 and NT factor which explains the slight differences that in, in, in all of these, okay? All right. Thanks for that question. So Faye, I see that you started to write a question to me, but only part of it came through. And I'm just scrolling to see if there was another part here. And I do not see that you sent a second part. So I'm not going to be able to answer your question. There's not enough there for me to answer. Hello, Geraldine. Let's see. I've been taking Otoba Bark and Cat's Claw for about two and a half months after... 11 weeks of triple antibiotic therapy for Lyme. Is it typical to have good periods than flare-ups during the treatment period? Why do these intensification of symptoms like muscle pain happen? So um, Lyme disease, it, it's common in people with Lyme disease to have good days and bad days, okay? Why all of a sudden you'll get a flare-up? There's no reasonable explanation for it. There is a pattern that happens often though, in that whether you're on treatment or not on treatment, is that it's very common that people with Lyme will have worsening of symptoms that seems to occur about every four weeks, every three to four weeks, I should say. And we think that has something to do with the growth cycle of the germ, that the germ is growing more rapidly and replicating on about an every four week cycle. And because of that, you wind up getting more inflammation created by that, and you can have a flare up in your symptoms. Okay, so that's one explanation for it. All right. Okay. Thanks for your question.
Hello, Diane. Let's see. Hello. Thank you, Dr. Ross. I have heard not to use ibuprofen, but use Tylenol for COVID. Is aspirin okay to use in the event that someone has the virus? Stay safe. We are staying safe out here, um, by the way. We um, actually are doing only telemedicine visits, and it's just me and my receptionist that are in here right now, and we keep our six feet distance, too. So we definitely are, and I'm, I'm using my face mask when I'm out in public. I mean, I'm doing everything to prevent getting this that I can, okay? Um, and many of you know I have a whole article about that as well, but I won't go into it right now. So, yeah, you know, there's um, some data suggesting that people that use standard anti-inflammatory anti-inflammatories like ibuprofen do worse um, in uh, COVID-19. And actually, I would put aspirin in that category. OK, so I would avoid that. Tylenol works through an entirely different mechanism and should be OK. All right. And um, I hope you're staying safe, too. Thank you. Hello, Adam. Let's see. Hello. Have you any success with low dose naltrexone for your chronic Lyme patients? Yes, I do. And, and there's a couple things that I find successful with it. So first of all, let me, I, as I, I had briefly described it before, but I was briefly describing what happens on the pain side of things, the muscular pain and neurologic pain side of things. Okay. And that is that the naltrexone binds a receptor in the brain on your nerve, um, on a, on, on, um, an immune system cell in the brain called a microglia, and it binds a receptor there that can modulate neurologic transmission of pain, which seems to help with fibromyalgia pain, okay? In addition, the other thing that low-dose naltrexone does is it binds to a group of receptors in our body, which are called endorphin receptors. So endorphins are our body's natural narcotic system, and we make endorphins to regulate pain, but the endorphins we make also regulate the immune system and they create better balance between inflammation and between um, uh, parts of our immune system that tend to be more allergic type acting, okay? So they regulate, they can result in better regulation of inflammation within the body. All right, now the way that, that it can work, it, or the, the mechanism by how it works is that when these endorphin receptors are blocked by naltrexone binding to them, the brain doesn't like that. And the brain creates extra signals and messengers that go out to these, um, um, that go out to the body and they start telling the body to make more endorphins, okay? So the body does, body makes a lot more endorphins. The other thing that happens is the endorphin receptors that are blocked become more sensitive to the endorphins, okay? So now what happens is if you're using low dose naltrexone, usually by around four to six hours later after you take your dose, the, the, endor the uh, naltrexone will go away and those receptors are no longer blocked, but they're increasingly sensitive and there's this extra endorphins that have been made. So they wind up getting flooded with all these extra endorphins, okay? And that has a, a, a way of regulating the immune system to be not as inflammatory, all right? So people with that use this may get better immune function and they get better pain control. Now, does it work in everyone? No. Um, in fact, I think it works probably maybe about 20% of the time, but it is something that can be worth trying. Who I find it works best in are people that have also have autoimmune illness as part of their life. So people that have rheumatoid arthritis or lupus or scleroderma, people that have autoimmune illnesses, you know, uh, lupus, I guess would be another one. Um, they tend to, they can do better when, especially those people can do better. But I still find about 20% of the line people can do um, better by using it. If you are going to do it, a couple words of warning on it, try to give it at least a six month try before you think, say, if it's going to help you or not. Okay. All right. That's, um, that's the main thing that I would suggest on that. Okay. All right. Uh, thanks for that question. I, I showed you that LDN article earlier. Um, you find it at my Lyme disease information site, but if you want more information about LDN, take a look at that article. Okay. All right. Hello, Jane. Let's see. I'm taking cryptolepis and minocycline, 100 milligrams for persistent Lyme symptoms of foot numbness, neuropathy, and symptoms. 
All right, Jane, let me see if there's another part to your question here. All right. Nope, I don't see anything there. Jane, I don't know what the question is here, and I don't see a second part to your question. Okay. So I'm not going to be able to answer. All right. Good luck to you. Hello, Heather. Let's see. Hi, Dr. Ross. Ever since I got Lyme, my brain MRIs have showed what I think are called white matter lesions. On the report, it states that the cause can be from migraines or Lyme, and I have both. If the lesions are caused by Lyme, is there a specific treatment protocol? Does this mean I have neuro Lyme? Years ago, an infectious disease doctor said that if brain lesions are present, that he, he treats with IV antibiotics. I've done oral antibiotics already, and I'm starting an herbal protocol. Would this be sufficient to treat neuro Lyme? I definitely can't afford IV treatment, thank you. So Heather, the answer is yes, orals can work on neuro Lyme. The fact that you do have lesions like this does mean you have neuro Lyme. Um, could IV antibiotics be more effective at getting at it? Possibly, but oral regimens can work. I find oral regimens work about 90% of the time. IV works about 95% of the time. So you get maybe a better chance they would work if you do IV. But, you know, you run into a lot of risk factors of using IV too. You'd have to have a PICC line put in, which is an IV line that's left in place. And those IV lines get complications uh, pretty often, actually. Um, maybe about 20% of the time people will get complications from them and they have to be removed. And those complications are infection in your bloodstream, okay, or blood clots that form at the tip, okay. So we want, I try to avoid using IVs unless we need to, okay. All right. Um, thank you for that question. Oops, it's a second part to one of the questions I looked at earlier. Hello, Duncan. It seems like a lot of Lyme-related issues are difficult to test for, including Lyme itself and the co-infections. If a patient doesn't really know what the cause of illness is, but Lyme has been suggested, do you recommend treating for Borrelia as well as Bartonella babesia? Would you recommend doxy, rifampin, atovacone, azithromycin, and grapeseed? How long should the patient stay on this before determining if treatment is working? Also, do you have any advice for tinnitus in tick-borne illnesses? All right, so let's start with tinnitus. Tinnitus is ringing in the ears, okay? And it usually means that there's some degree of neurologic injury to, to, one of the, to the hearing nerve, okay? Um, it's not an easy condition to treat, but sometimes it can get better. Uh, one thing that is, comes to us from standard medicine is things we would try for anyone, okay? So first of all, uh, limiting caffeine can sometimes help people, and sometimes avoiding alcohol can help people, okay? From an alternative medicine standpoint, one thing that can sometimes help, maybe helps about 20 or 30% of people, is to try to improve blood flow to the hearing nerve, and that is to use uh, something called ginkgo biloba, which makes your blood a little thinner, a little more flexible to go into the narrow blood vessels that, that feed those nerves, okay? And that would be to use 80 milligrams of ginkgo biloba twice a day. The other thing I have found helpful for some people is to do acupuncture, so get needle for it, okay? And then finally, there is a... Um, type of light massage treatment called cranial sacral therapy, which involves putting a, a pressure equal of about five grams, the weight of a nickel on your head bones and pressuring them in different ways to actually cause relaxation um, that can sometimes be helpful in terms of the nerve irritation going on too. Okay, so those are some things to think about. Okay, now, I don't advocate just doing a gunshot approach to the treatment, okay, as you're suggesting. 
if Bartonella and Babesia are there, they should have symptoms that suggest them, all right? So for instance, Babesia symptoms would be things like drenching night sweats, air hunger, panic attacks, headaches in the front of the head, and migraines. Those are some big things that can suggest Babesia is there. Things that suggest Bartonella is there are um, a pain on the soles of the feet, uh, a lot of neurologic symptoms, um, uh, having a lot of psychiatric problems like hallucinations or uh, dissociation where you feel you're out of your body basically, um, or ongoing persistent anxiety or depression. Those are things that can sometimes indicate that Bartonella is there. Bartonella also can give you a lot of tremors, sometimes can give you seizure-like disorder, um, can give you a head pressure kind of headache. So, you know, if you've got symptoms suggesting uh, Bartonella, and Babesia, I do treat based on those. I don't just treat for them if I don't have symptoms, some symptoms that can suggest them to me, okay? All right, so if you're looking at how do you diagnose Bartonella and Babesia based on symptoms, let me just do a quick screen share here for that. All right, so take a look at my chapter on how to diagnose. All right, it's right there. Okay, and read through the symptoms I have here for how to diagnose Bartonella, and then read for the symptoms I have here about how to diagnose Babesia. Okay, all right. All right, thanks for the question, Duncan. Oh, one more part of your question, Duncan. So yeah, there are times with Lyme, Lyme especially, not so much Bartonella babesia. Bartonella babesia, I will only treat if there are symptoms there. If you are on a good Bartonella or babesia treatment, things you use for the Bartonella or babesia should start giving you improvements within one to two months on those symptoms, okay? The Lyme germ gets to be a little bit trickier in that Lyme um, is a very slow replicating germ. By some estimates, it replicates about once a month. Okay. And so therefore, when we use it, when things replicate slowly, they're harder to kill. Things that replicate quickly, like Bartonella that replicates every 24 hours, tend to tend to respond more quickly to antibiotics. Okay. So there's been some studies looking at how quickly do people respond to treatment for Lyme disease. And in this, and it was not a published study, but it was presented at the International Lyme Associated Diseases Society a number of years ago. And what was shown in that study is people were put on biaxin and flagell to treat their Lyme germs. And what was shown is that by three months, 30% of people started having improvements. By six months, 60% of people started having improvements. And by nine months, 90% of people started having improvements, okay? So it takes a while with Lyme to start getting better, okay? All right, thanks for that question. Hello, Lindsay, hold on here just a minute. Hello, I've been taking Banderol Cemento for three months, followed by one month of Biocide and LSF to treat Lyme. I'm curious about the effectiveness of switching to Cryptolepis and Japanese knotweed as opposed to going back on Banderol Cemento. Thanks. Okay. So there was, um, I think many of you may be aware, there's a study that, uh, that was published by the Bay Area Lyme Disease Foundation, or it was in their newsletter, but it was um, based on funding that they gave out. And in this project, the authors looked at a number of herbs that could treat Lyme, and they found that cryptolepis, which we usually use to treat Babesia, it's an anti-malarial herb, they found on petri dish experiments that it can treat Lyme, okay? So these days, people are starting to try it. I will let you know, I've used a lot of cryptolepis in my practice to help treat Babesia. I find it to be an act of an effective anti-babesia agent, but I have not seen good results in terms of ability to help Lyme. 
So I'm skeptical, even though it's been shown to work on Petri dish lab experiments. Uh, keep in mind what happens on a Petri dish does not necessarily happen in a human. Okay. All right. And so I, I'm not advocating it as a Lyme germ treatment. I do like using it to treat Babesia though. Okay. All right. Um, so I think you'd be better off going back on a Banderol Cemento actually. Okay. All right. Thanks for the question, Lindsay. Hello, Mike. Let's see. Hey, Marty. Missing rides in the Texas sunshine yet. <laughs> what Mike is referring to is I ride a big motorcycle. I, I ride something called a Victory Crossroads motorcycle, which would be the size of some of the big Harleys, okay? Um, and um, I had a ball that year that I was living in Texas last year. I think many of you know I was living there while I was still fighting with my medical board up here in Washington State um, over their disagreement with how I manage Lyme. When I was living in Texas, I had a great old time going out regularly in that hot sunshine and riding out in Texas Hill Country, which has all these twisty, windy, curvy, up and down kind of roads. Okay. And so, yeah, I actually have been missing that. Um, in fact, I wound up going out for, uh, we finally have gotten into the weather that I feel comfortable, more comfortable riding here in the Seattle area. I, I tend to like riding at least 50 degree or hotter weather. If it's gonna be in the forties, I just don't like getting cold. So recently I've been able to get out and I gotta tell you, it's not the same riding here as it was in Texas, Mike. So thank you for bringing that up. And I have been missing those rides, um, but I'm still having a good time out here riding around too. All right, so thank you for that. Thank you for reminding me of that, yeah. Hello, Lori. Let's see, my son is um, on um, ketofifen for Lyme. I think he had a mild case of Corona. Lori, I'm trying to see if there's a second part here. And I'm not seeing a second part. So I'm not sure what to say. All right, thanks for that. Let's see, hello, Duncan. Let's see, also, if a patient has POTS, is this most likely to be the result of Babesia? Does the POTS go away by just treating Babesia or do you recommend pursuing separate POTS treatment uh, potentially IVIG. At what point during Babesia treatment does POTS resolve? All right, so uh, POTS, everyone stands for postural orthostatic tachycardic syndrome, okay? And what happens is, is you have some uh, dysregulation of the chemicals that control your heart rate and your blood pressure. So there's a nerve, a cranial nerve, a, a, a nerve that comes out in our, out of the base of our brain, uh, right back in this area called the vagal nerve. And the vagal nerve makes uh, chemicals uh, that are adrenaline and anti-adrenaline, okay? So the adrenaline chemicals will maintain your blood pressure, cause your heart to beat at the right rate or maybe even race. The anti-adrenaline one chemicals are supposed to balance the adrenaline. And if you get too many anti-adrenalines and you can't keep your blood pressure up and your heart slows down quite a bit, okay? So people that have this uh, postural orthostatic tachycardic syndrome notice that they get um, that when they go from laying down to going upright, that tends to trigger a lot of dizziness and lightheadedness sometimes, sometimes racing of the heart. And we can sometimes measure that on a, a, something called a tilt table test, where when you're laying down, they measure your heart rate and your blood pressure, and then they sit you up and they watch what happens, okay? It's called a tilt table test, okay? All right, but it doesn't just happen in some people when you get, when you're laying down to sitting up, it's a dysregulation of this, the vagal nerve and the adrenaline, anti-adrenaline system that can happen for no reason at all. Suddenly you just have a dysfunctional firing. So sometimes when you're already upright and your blood pressure is going well, all of a sudden your heart will start racing and you drop your blood pressure, okay? Now, what triggers POTS? Well, infections do. 
and specifically Lyme can because it, it can infect the vagal nerve. But we also know that Babesia does too, although I got to tell you, I don't know the exact mechanism by which it does. Can POTS get better when you treat Babesia? Yes, I have seen it get better. Usually it's going to get better around the third or fourth month, but that's the only thing that you need to do is to treat your Babesia to get rid of POTS. Okay. All right. Thanks for the question, Dr. I think we already talked about that, Adam. Hello, Marie Eve. Hold on here just a minute. Hi, Dr. Ross. Can green juices, celery juice, for instance, feed yeast in the intestines? Also, you explained a few weeks ago how detoxing from heavy metals doesn't come first in your protocol. If after a few months you realize heavy metals are an issue, what do you use to detox them from the body? Last question, is it important to support mitochondria during the protocol? And if so, how? Oh, thank you. Okay, so any juices, um, whether they're vegetable juice or fruit juice, um, juices are pretty much sugar okay and they're fructose sugar but they're still sugar and that sugar can feed yeast in your intestines when those sugars are part of the whole vegetable or the whole fruit they're um, kind of tied up with the fiber and they're less available to feed your yeast okay so if you've got yeast problems or if we're working to prevent yeast problems i'm not an advocate of doing juicing of any kind you're better off eating the whole vegetable or eating the whole fruit, and you'll probably be fine if you do it that way, okay? All right, and that includes celery juice too. I know the medical medium is a big celery juicer, but um, I'm not sure of the true utility of that. I know he's a big advocate of that, for instance, okay? Um, all right, regarding heavy metals, so the agent, so one, um, there's different chemicals that we can use that are metal magnets, if you will, that will bind heavy metals in our bodies to pull them out, okay? And you can either take these chemicals as I, in an IV form, you can do some of them rectally, or you can take some of them orally. And the way you choose which ones you're gonna use are based upon what are the elevated heavy metals, okay? So for instance, if your heavy metals are pretty much a mix of lead and mercury, one of the agents that can work well is an oral agent called DMSA. You can also do DMSA as an IV too. There, if it, your issue is primarily more lead, EDTA may be the better agent to use for that, okay? So an EDTA can be done rectally, EDTA can be done IV, okay? So anyhow, it all depends on what your profile is as to which chelator you're gonna wind up choosing, all right? Let's see. Oh, mitochondria support. So I usually will start doing something to repair mitochondria if I get about six months to nine months into treatment and a person is not getting much better. Then I might start adding in mitochondria support. The reason I don't do it right away is there's many things that add together to give fatigue in a person, okay? One of those is excess cytokines. And in fact, it's a major cause in most people, all right? The other is adrenal and thyroid dysfunction. And then finally, you can also get into mitochondria dysfunction. So often though, for most people, you don't have to do mitochondria repair. If you just knock enough germ load down, that's gonna result in the cytokines decreasing and people will get better energy just because you've done that, okay? The other thing is if you can get your adrenals and thyroid working better by using ashwagandha, that herb that I talk about using ashwagandha, then you often don't need to resort um, um, to doing anything else to fix the body, okay? But if doing adrenal thyroid support and lowering cytokines by treating infections and using uh, the herbs that I recommend to lower cytokines don't work by six to nine months, then I think it's a good idea to start doing um, supplements that can do repair your energy factories, the energy factories being the mitochondria, okay? All right, thanks for the question.
right. So you guys, you may wonder why it is that I stage things. Like I do this first and that first. So look, this is an illness that you can throw thousands of dollars at. You could take so many supplements to correct this deficiency and that deficiency. And, you know, I use supplements in my practice, but I try to be um, reasonable about the number that I have people take. And I, I'm not a firm believer you have to fix everything. You just need to fix the right things in an order that gets a person well, okay? And so I try to, I tend to be, even though I do recommend supplements, I tend to be more of a minimalist and I'm only gonna do it if other steps first don't fix the problem basically, okay? All right, thank you. Yeah, let's see here. Hello, Mike. Let's see. Do you have knowledge of the BD glucan fungital systemic fungal test or fungal test? No, I don't. So I, I can't comment on that, Mike. Thank you. Hello, Tracy. Let's see, my daughter is on a number of herbs for Lyme to downregulate cytokines, including cordyceps, um, EGCG, uh, polygonum, scutellaria. Is there a risk that these herbs may reduce cytokines, might hamper her innate immune system to respond to COVID if she gets it? Um, no, I mean, the, the innate, um, so, okay, so everyone, we have two parts to our immune system or there's a way you can divide the immune system into two parts, okay, for the sake of this explanation. There's something called the adaptive immune system and something called the innate immune system, all right? The innate immune system is the part of our immune system that fights germs or toxins or things that we have not seen before, all right, um, that our body has not learned to fight before. The adaptive immune system is used to treat the things that, um, that is what we use to treat things we have seen before or we've gotten immunizations for, okay? So for instance, it's the adaptive immune system and the T cells that make up the adaptive immune system that fight Lyme if it's been in you for a while. And it is the immunization you got that turns on your B cells to make antibodies against the flu if you happen to have got that. So that's all the adaptive immune system, okay? Now, cytokines are a key messenger in that part of the immune system. They are not as important of a messenger in the innate immune system, all right? So no, I don't think there's a risk of that. In fact, COVID-19, one of the thing, reasons that we think people get into trouble um, with their lungs getting really bad and some people going into it, what's known as acute respiratory distress syndrome is that in, um, in COVID-19, people tend to get an overproduction of cytokines and they get these cytokine storms that can damage tissue. And so there's a good argument to be made because COVID does work this way. That is a good thing to be on cytokine blockers to prevent that from happening. Okay. All right. Uh, thanks for that question, Tracy. Let's see. Hello, Kathy. Let's see. Or Kathy. Um, currently have an odd sore throat and wondering if it is yeast related symptom. No change in voice, but inside the throat feels warm, swollen, and I can feel my pulse there. No fever. Thank you for the work you do. Be happy and well. Uh, thanks, Kathy. So, you know, um, when you get too many yeast in the intestines, you can also sometimes get too many yeast in the back of the throat and in the food pipe, okay? So symptoms that you have too many yeast in your food pipe can be difficulty swallowing. Things actually feel like they get caught here. Or you can have rawness. It feels very raw and painful when you swallow things, okay? In the very back of the throat, sometimes you can get redness and inflammation that also makes it painful to swallow things too. So could 
uh, a sore throat be a sign of yeast? Yeah. But I would also look for other signs. Like, does it feel like things are getting hung up in your chest? I would look to see, do you have increased sugar cravings? Are you having intestinal gassiness and bloating? The other thing can happen if you have too many yeast in your system. Sometimes people will get a lot more pimples and acne. Okay. So I would be looking for those um, uh, as well, too. Okay. All right. Uh, thanks for your question, Kate. Uh, Kathy. Good luck to you. Hello, Barbara. Let's see, Dr. Marty, I had an acquaintance diagnosed with Lyme 14 years ago who recently had multiple hospitalizations for abnormally high ammonia levels that they couldn't bring down. The doctors would not even consider Lyme causation despite textbook ILAD symptoms. Her liver and kidneys began to fail, so they transferred to hospice. I referred her family to you and I had offered to give up my upcoming appointment with an ILADS and shoemaker trained doc for her, but she died last week. Oh, I'm sorry to hear that. Um, angering discouraged doesn't begin to cover how I feel. How can we stop this madness? I've written letters to all my medical, all my political reps. What can I and, and we do to change this travesty? I also wanted to ask if you thought resveratrol would be a good supplement to take now besides quercetin, given uh, the COVID-9 pandemic. All right. So, um, Barbara, to your first question, um, it's, a difficult, it's a difficult situation. The average physician, the infectious disease doctors just will not accept Lyme disease as being a chronic condition. And although I think we're starting to see more societal acceptance of it now, especially among people, um, the infectious disease doctors are still a major obstacle. And unfortunately, at this point, the best we can keep doing is try to work around them the best we can. But I, I don't have an easy solution for you. I mean, my, my choice in the whole thing has just been to be as loud as I can by talking publicly about Lyme like this, by challenging my medical board, by doing all of that, because I think we need to, keep, I don't think we sh as physicians should remain silent. I do think we should be out there. We should risk our licenses like I did. We should make that, we should make it known, okay? But uh, that doesn't mean change comes about fast, but we are starting to see some glimmers of hope out there that physicians, the average physician, I think is moving away from the IDSA position. In fact, if you look at what the, uh, there's been studies, I believe, done by the Centers for Disease Control that now show that the average physician does not use the two to four weeks of antibiotics recommended by IDSA. Rather, they work for months with antibiotics because they know that something else is going on that the current IDSA position is captured, okay? But it's a slow change. It's not going to be fast, but we just need to keep standing on our soapboxes and advocating. Um, I do it. I know you do it. And that's, I think, the best that we can wind up doing, okay? Unfortunately, I'm, I'm sorry to hear about your friend too. Um, in terms of your questions about quercetin and the COVID-19, okay. So um, many of you may be aware, I've, I've written an article about some ideas on what you can do about COVID-19, specifically things you can do to prevent getting it. Uh, one of the things I add that I mentioned and there are a number of herbs you can take to boost your innate immune system to uh, be ready to deal with COVID-19. But the other thing I mentioned in there is if you get um, do get a COVID-19 infection, you want to do things to limit cytokines so you don't get the cytokine storm. The other thing I mentioned is that you could use um, something called quercetin and you could use um, um, I, uh, zinc, actually, as a means of treating COVID-19 if you get it as well, too, okay? So let me just talk about that. So quercetin is beneficial in a couple ways. One is it lowers cytokines, okay? But the other thing quercetin may be is something called a zinc ionophore, meaning it helps transport zinc to the inside of cells. And zinc inside cells blocks an enzyme involved in virus replication, the COVID-19 virus replication, okay? By comparison, the Plaquenil that everyone is, is you know, trying and our president has advocated for, et cetera, is, um, is also thought to work because it also is a zinc ionophore and it helps pull 
uh, zinc inside cells, which blocks virus replication. Also, the uh, plaquenil is um, anti-cytokine, okay? So it has a similar effect to what the quercetin would here, okay? Um, but the other thing that is useful to do, I think, especially if somebody gets starts getting symptoms of having COVID-19, would be not only to do quercetin and zinc, but would also to be on other agents that can lower cytokines. In the article, I mentioned curcumin and I mentioned glutathione, but also resveratrol is another option that you could look at too, okay? All right, so now that I've been asked about it, let me just do a, show you my article here, everyone, real quick. All right, so let's got to search up here. I'm gonna put COVID-19. This is my um, article on um, how to manage COVID-19 in Lyme. And I updated it on the third, so just about six days ago. Um, a lot of the update was, be, um, so anyhow, you read it. It's a much more extensive article than I had originally written back on March 4th. And in here, I do talk about uh, things you can do to prevent getting it. I even talk about how to wear a face mask. I talk about supporting the innate immune system. I talk about things to prevent the cytokine storm that's giving the acute respiratory distress syndrome. And I talk about things you can do to stop the virus uh, replication, okay? So in my recommendations, I talk about trying to prevent getting the infection. I do things to help promote a healthy immune system, which would be get sleep for seven to nine hours a night. Uh, try to decrease stress. Stress is one of the worst suppressors of the immune system. Try a number of supplements that boost the immune system and decrease the uh, virus infectivity and prevent cytokine storm by being on quercetin and being on zinc, okay? And then I also recommend what to do if you do get infected. One is stop the virus replication and decrease cytokines. And one another way to do that is the hydroxychloroquine, plaquenil, and uh, Zithromax, okay, plus zinc. And then finally, you should lower cytokines, maybe on curcumin, quercetin, and glutathione. But the resveratrol that you just mentioned is an option as well too, okay? Barbara, thank you for that question. Hello, David. Let's say hello, Dr. Ross. Thank you for continuing to have these webinars. Uh, you're welcome. In your estimation, when do you foresee patients who will need to travel cross country to see you being able to safely make the journey? Also, if a new patient has already been through a myriad of tests prior to seeing you, with those test results in their possession, how recent do said tests need to be in order to still be considered usable? Thank you and stay safe. Okay, so for Lyme types of testing, the Lyme germ testing and uh, whether that's through Igenix, Armin, whatever lab you're using, um, you know, they don't necessarily need to be current because once positive, it, it doesn't matter. Even if we went back and tested again, it came back negative, I'd still be focused on the test that was originally positive. And the reason I would do that is the, the immune system sometimes will be more reactive than other times most of these tests that we use to diagnose the infections are immune system tests, okay? All right, um, All right. then in terms of labs like your kidney liver testing, thyroid testing, et cetera, I usually like those to be current within about six months, okay? All right, then I honestly don't know when it's gonna be safe to travel. You know, I am looking forward at this thing I do know that you know we have definitely flattened the curve here in Washington state. And that's because we started doing lockdown out here way before the rest of the country did. And we did it originally with our, our governor basically seeing what was going on and asking the large corporations at first to have people start working at home. And eventually we now have a stay at home order, okay? But if you look at our curve, it's very flat. Uh, that's not the case in other parts of the country. And I think, um, and I know there's a lot of tension right now. I mean, our um, our pretender in chief, as I call him, because I think he's just been an absolutely worthless leader when it comes to the COVID-19. And I say that quite strongly. This guy should have two months before 
we actually, we knew COVID was gonna come here, right? You could look over in China, two months before it hit our shores, it was coming. And he basically sat and denied it. And if he hadn't been denying it, we might've been in a place to have testing in place so that we could accurately go out, test people. If they were positive, then we could do contact tasting. And if we were doing contract tracing, we could have then more appropriately said who had to be in isolation and who did not. And because he dropped the ball so badly, we now have a devastated economy. Okay, honestly, if testing was in place and we had contract uh, contact tracing in place, we wouldn't have to do these massive stay-at-home orders. We would be ordering people infected to stay at home, okay? So our president, the great uh, person that has uh, claimed responsibility for a great economy, actually is the person responsible for killing the economy because he denied that this was gonna be a big problem for so long. And I know that may be controversial, the opinion is controversial, but I actually have started referring to this as the Trump virus. It became the Trump virus when he didn't act, do anything to prevent it and get the government ready and get testing ready until it was already on our shores and turned into a disaster. And I, I hope those of you that are supporters of him will keep that in mind when you think about revoting for him. He has been the worst thing for this infection. Um, so anyhow, I'll come off my soapbox now. <laughs> I probably have lost a few of you listening in in the future here too. But the biggest problem right now is that it is still silently spreading through our communities, okay? I do think that with the flattening of the curve, that probably eventually we are gonna be able to start traveling again, but I suspect it's gonna be all the way till the end of May. But even then, even then when we start doing it, it's going to be out there. It's gonna be still silently in the community and we're all gonna be at risk um, probably until, and I, I agree, I mean, Dr. Fauci has been saying we're probably gonna have a resurgence in the fall. I would agree with it. Sadly, I think we're gonna be looking at Corona being part of our culture for up to a year until we get an adequate vaccine put in place, okay? I, I just think that's the sad truth of it right now. And it's because it was bungled so badly to begin with here. Uh, anyhow, those are my thoughts. Um, I am, in terms of seeing patients, I am seeing them by telemedicine visits. I have waived the requirement that people see me in office for a first visit. Um, and instead asking patients that they see me doing telemedicine visits. Um, I do want people eventually to be able to travel to see me when it is safe to do so. I honestly do not think it'll be safe to do so until after Memorial Day, and I may be wrong. It may take longer than that, or maybe it'll be shorter than that, okay? Um, if we ever got an adequate system of testing put in place, we could adequately go out and test and screen and isolate people. And then I, I think if we ever get to that point, and we're still nowhere near that point, um, but if we ever get to that point, we may be able to travel more safely because we'll know who really is infected and they will be in their homes. Okay. All right. Thanks for that question, David. Um, good luck to you. Hello, Mike. Let's see. Any knowledge of using oral sodium thiosulfate as a detox binder? Um, no, I'm, I'm not familiar with that one at all. All right. Uh, but thanks for bringing it to my attention. Hello, Lindsay. Let's see. Hi. My husband has been taking Banderol and Cemento for three months, followed by Biocide and LSF for one month to treat Lyme. Curious about the effect. Oh, you already asked me that earlier. I've answered that one. Hello, Birgit. Uh, thank you so much, Dr. Ross. Do you have any updates of supplements helpful for preventing and treating coronavirus? So Birgit, I'm not gonna go through it here, but take a look at my article that I showed earlier. It's pretty extensive. It gives you the information to answer that question. Okay, all right. Hello, Mike. K 
Can a positive band 41 on a Western blot test be from a worm other than a Lyme worm? Say like a uh, cystic, I can't even say the word. Um, so probably not. The, the, we do think that, well, actually, I don't know. I don't honestly know. So band 41 is, um, when we say, okay, so in terms of Western blots, when we say band 41, what we're talking about is a protein that is found on the covering of the Lyme germ that weighs 41 kilodaltons, okay? And if you happen to have antibodies, uh, so that what we do in a Western blot is we're looking to see, does your immune system make antibodies that attach to certain proteins found on the covering of the germ? One of those proteins is this protein that weighs 41 kilodaltons. And if you get antibodies stuck on it, it could indicate Lyme. However, the, the, this protein 41 happens to be found as a protein that is found on, on germs that have flagella or tails, okay? And so just finding a protein 41 by itself could be a false positive. I don't know whether this worm you're talking about has a protein 41 or not. I, I honestly don't know, all right? So I can't answer that one, Mike. Hello, Rachel, let's see, doc. How do I get rid of excessive diarrhea and extreme weight loss? So Rachel, that's a complicated question. Um, I, I would need to talk to you more to find out what studies have been done to look at your diarrhea. Um, have they done an adequate evaluation to see which infections could be causing it? Have they done adequate evaluation to make sure you're making um, a number of um, uh, adequate uh, enzymes in your pancreas to aid in digestion? Have they done evaluations to see if you have the adequate makeup of the right bacteria in your intestines to help with it? Um, and did somebody scope you at one time, the GI doctors, to see if you might have an inflammatory condition called ulcerative colitis uh, or Crohn's disease that could be giving the diarrhea, okay? So I, I need to know more about what's been done before I can give specific advice, but I would make sure all those things have been done. Okay, all right, thanks for the question. Hello, Faye. Let's see here. Sorry for that slip of the finger. <laughs> oh, okay. You're coming back to tell me what your question was. All right. I'm taking transfer factor L plus along with some other supplements and DMSA protocol for elevated levels, lead levels. You suggested I take vitamin D 5000 and along with it as I have been on it for such a long time. I remember you say not to take vitamin D more than four to six weeks as you can get toxic um, and and have level taken, would that also apply to me if I've been taking it on the DMSA days only, um, on the no DMSA days only? Faye, it's, yeah, I, it's, so everyone, there's a concern with vitamin D that you could get too much, okay, and you could get toxic. Um, I will tell you the science on that's a little bit iffy, but there is a concern, okay? I find effective ranges that support your uh, bone so it's not breaking down in osteoporosis. And if your bone breaks down in osteoporosis, your bone is a lead sink, okay? And if it's breaking down, it's gonna be spilling lead into your blood. But if you wanna stabilize that bank, you wanna be on vitamin D. Also, vitamin D is useful to help your immune system work better, okay? And so a healthy level of vitamin D, and these are using American values, I believe the Canadian values are reported differently, but in the American value system, it would be to be levels of about 50 to 80 uh, would be what we would wanna be, okay? Faye, I would definitely get yourself checked to see where you are at this point, if you've been on vitamin D that long, okay? All right, thank you for that question. And, and the goal would be to keep it in those American values of 50 to 80, okay? 
Thanks for the question. Hi, Angie. Let's see, are there additional supplements for boosting energy while taking herbal treatments? So, yeah, in terms of boosting energy, there's a few things that I like to emphasize. Number one, get sleep. Get seven to nine hours of sleep. And if you need to take herbs to get seven to nine hours of sleep, get herbs to get seven to nine hours of sleep, okay? Number two, support your adrenals and thyroid. And what I like to use to support the adrenals and thyroid is a Chinese and Ayurvedic medicine herb called ashwagandha. Ashwagandha has been observed for thousands of years in those cultures to produce better energy, okay? And also we have animal studies, laboratory experiments that show that the thyroid and adrenal function improves when people are on ashwagandha as well too. So the way I like to use that is 400 milligram pill, and I suggest that people take it as two of those pills in the morning and two between one and two, okay? And then the other thing I like to have people do is lower cytokines, okay? So as I mentioned earlier tonight, cytokines are good and bad. One of the outcomes if you have too many cytokines is they lower energy. So at a minimum, be on a liposomal curcumin like the Thorn Mariva 500, and you'd wanna take one pill three times a day, okay? And then finally, um, if you have low energy at six months or so into treatment and you're not improving, then you want to start doing things to repair and support your energy factories in your cells called mitochondria. You're either going to, and you want to rebuild the fat membrane covering of the mitochondria. And the way that I'm suggesting people do that now is to take a product called ATP 360 by Research Nutritionals. You would do three pills one time a day. The other thing that a minimum thing you can do that helps the mitochondria work better would also to be on liposomal glutathione. That means glutathione that's microscopically wrapped in fat to increase its absorption. Uh, glutathione is a very powerful antioxidant that fixes damage and can fix the damage of your mitochondria from the inside of the mitochondria, while your ATP 360 would be fixing damage to the membrane from the outside, okay? So you get fixing on both sides of the mitochondria. If you're to use that liposomal glutathione, I would be taking it as a 400 to 500 milligrams one time a day. The product I like for that is Research Nutritional Try Fortify, and you would wanna do five milliliters, which is one teaspoon, one time a day of that, okay? All right, I hope it gives you some things to think about. All right, uh, good luck to you, Angie. Hello, Joyce. Let's see here. Um, hi, Dr. Ross. I have listened to others on this webinar talk about muscle pain. I have had Lyme and Bartonella since 2001, and muscle pain started a few years ago. When it first started, I was able to deal with the pain by adding trace minerals to my water. More recently, my muscles became stringy and very tight and painful despite curcumin, Epsom salt, as anti-inflammatory diet. Uh, MSM with nothing helping too much. The pain is spreading over time and currently my shoulders have been giving me the most trouble. I do a great deal of research on Lyme, etc. and recently came across an article stating how Lyme can alter the integrity of the shoulder joint. Are you aware of this? I lead a very healthy, active, and holistic lifestyle, so I am beyond frustrated. Thank you as always for being there for us. Stay well. So Joyce, I haven't seen that specific article, but yeah, Lyme can alter the joints. It can lead to breakdown of cartilage in the joints. It can sometimes result in the fibrous capsule that holds the joints together, stretching out. I mean, there are numerous ways that it can do that, all right? One thing you might wanna look at for your type of pain, and I mentioned it earlier tonight in an earlier question, the person that wrote about possible MS Lyme uh, giving a lot of muscle tension pain is to consider trying low-dose naltrexone to see if it can alter the neurologic transmission of the pain that's happening with you, okay? All right, and I, I showed everyone that article earlier. You may wanna take a look at that, okay? All right, uh, good luck to you, Joyce. Hello, Carol. See, what do you think of artemisinin for COVID? Um, so I don't think it will work. Um, and let, let me talk about it. So 
I know there's a number of people that have, uh, so as many of you know, there's this medicine called Plaquenil, also known as hydroxychloroquine, that we use in the world of Lyme, and we use it to regulate inflammation. We also use it in the world of Lyme because it can help um, certain antibiotics work better inside of your cells, okay? All right, so I'm very familiar with the drug. Um, and it's been shown, it's been demonstrated um, in um, some studies that it can help with um, COVID-19. And there's a lot of doctors across the country that have been using it now and are reporting great benefit from it too. Now, it's not a solid research base, but there's enough there that I'm calling for people to use it, okay? And I do agree with using it, okay? So Plaquenil hydroxychloroquine is an anti-malarial. And because it's working, everyone suddenly thinks that anything that is an anti-malarial is supposed to work, okay? And the thing is, no, not, <coughs> excuse me, it's allergy season for me here. That is not my COVID-19, okay? But um, what everyone is thinking, uh, are, what people are confusing is that just because Plaquenil and anti-malaria medicine works, they're wondering if any anti-malaria medicine should work, okay? And the answer is no. The reason is, is that Plaquenil probably works for two reasons. Number one, it decreases the cytokine storm because it's anti-inflammatory, okay? And number two, as I mentioned earlier tonight, it is a good ionophore for carrying zinc to the inside of, of infected cells. And inside infected cells, zinc blocks enzymes that help replicate the virus. So you stop virus replication with it, okay? All right. Now, does artemisinin act as a zinc ionophore? I don't think so. I've never seen any science that says it does. Does cryptolepis, another herb that I know has been flying off of my shelves here at Marty Ross MD Supplements, does it work? Probably not. There's no studies that show it is a zinc ionophore, okay? So be careful. Just because we have a prescription anti-malaria medicine work, you have to understand why it's working. It's not that it's, it's, it's not working through its anti-malaria mechanism. It's working through an entirely different mechanism here, okay? And the, um, therefore, the herbs that we use that are anti-malarial probably are not going to work, okay? All right, including the artemisinin. Uh, thanks for that question. All right. Listen, everyone, that's it for me for tonight. Um, I've enjoyed visiting with you here. We will be here again live next week. All right, so come back. Um, I hope I didn't offend, offend too many Trump supporters tonight, but I just hope you all would really consider, is this guy adequate for leading our nation when we hit this kind of a crisis? And I would say the record says no. And I hope people would consider that <laughs> coming up. Um, anyhow, those are, I made those comments strongly earlier and, and I try not to make them again, but I hope even you Trump supporters will come back uh, next week uh, to participate here. Um, so keep an eye out in your email tomorrow morning, somewhere between 8.30 and 9.30 in the morning. Um, and you should, or 9 to 9.30 in the morning, you should see an email from me uh, that will get, tell you that the recording is ready to be viewed and provide the links for that as well too. It will also have in it the links uh, to sign up for next week's webinar, okay? All right, good night everyone um, and uh, good luck and, and um, as you deal with the COVID-19 out there and the world of Lyme disease as well too.